Welcome to this session. My name is Jutta Eckstein, and I'm based in Germany, and, well, I'm the track chair, as you heard in the morning, for today's conference, and um, I work as an agile coach consultant, have written several books. Today, this talk is about how I think that CD should actually not only stand for continuous delivery, but also for cultural differences. And let me start with a story, a real one. So um, a few years ago, I think it's about five years ago, GM had a problem. It was this Chevy Silverado, I think is the name of it. Um, when, when running idle, it ran on eight cylinders instead of two. So that led to overheating and the eventuality, and some cars did, the catch of fire. And because of that, GM had to recall 370,000 of those cars in order to fix that. So they had to go back into the garage, into the workshop, and being fixed. The repair actually was a software update. Okay, now, same year, different company, Tesla. So there the problem was that the adapter um, when charging had the problem also of overheating and some of the cars caught fire. So kind of a similar problem but different. Now um, what Tesla did was, well I heard this already somewhere there, providing a software update over the wire, OTA. And Elon Musk got really, really upset when the media was telling everywhere like, oh, Tesla had to recall 29,000 of their Model S. And Elon Musk said, well, no single car had to go into a garage or a workshop for that fix because the update was done over the air. Right? So they just checked, is the car at the moment driving or charging? And if not, we can safely do the update. I'm providing these stories because what they tell us is on the one hand that software is really making a huge difference to the products that are out there right now. And it also means if we do continuous delivery, it really means we have to look at this from different angles. There are different aspects we have to consider for continuous delivery. And the aspects that I'm seeing there are, and that's my agenda, on the one hand the technical, then the organizational and the market aspect. Let's go to the technical one. So for technical, I think most of the stuff that we talk about here is often about like tools and technologies. It's stuff like also like what Chess talked about. It touches sometimes also different aspects, but it's really more about, okay, which technology can we use? What, what is helping us to really be enabled to do continuous delivery? And it could start with automatic testing or pair programming, like the great workshop that's in parallel to this session, which I miss. Um, or using Kubernetes or whatever. However, what I also see with all those tools and technology that are used right now, that sometimes continuous delivery is actually more like uh, shipping continuously patches, and it's not really delivering something real. And also here, I want to give you an example. So this is one of my passions, actually, basketball. I'm, really tiny, in a small way, sponsoring a team in Germany as well. We had this story, I think it was also a few years ago, not too many, maybe three years ago, where a team in the second league of Germany had to win like their last game in order to stay in the second le le league. If they lose, they would have gone relegated and downgraded to the third league, right? Now, during that game, what happened was that one of the servers started a Windows update. And for whatever reason, and I don't understand, but anyway, they couldn't stop it. And on that, on that server, they had like almost anything connected to that. So like the timer 
or very important as well, the, the monitor, so the display where you see who is leading and who is trailing and who has how many fouls and timeouts and all of that, right? And what I didn't know, and that might be different from country to country, but what I didn't know until that time that if a game comes to a halt for longer than 15 minutes, then automatically the guest will win. And it will win by 20 O's. So 20 is not really a lot of points in basketball, but still winning is winning. And especially if it's about relegation or not, then it's a big thing. So um, that, that was a big thing. It was like Windows update causing that team to lose and being relegated. Actually, what's also fun, so this went through the media, media what's not really going through the media was later on that they rolled it back, and that was, to me at least, funny as well. They said, we are rolling it back because a Windows update is kind of an act of nature, so out of control, or in legal speak, it's an act of God. Okay, now we know where we are with Microsoft and Windows and so on. So that, that was kind of funny. So it, the end was good for that team, which wasn't my team, by the way, because, of course, we are playing first league, right? Um, good. So my point here is one problem with continuous delivery is often that, that we just think everyone is happy by having a new feature, software, patch, something, However, what we really require is to um, really allow the customer to pick and choose. To say, like, I want that feature, or I don't want that feature, and I want it now, I want it later, or whenever. And this is actually something that changes a lot in the way we, well, work with, with our software, but also in the way we work with the customers. And it also requires us to really understand multi-versioning. And multi-versioning, I don't mean like the real technical side. I think version management, we have all kind of figured out how this works. But more in a way that if a customer says, oh, I don't want to use that feature, but then several months later saying, I want to have that other feature, but we thought as software providers that the one feature builds up on the other. So that we kind of think, well, there's no way of using this without that. So we really have to provide more possibilities and configurations in order to really allow that the client for himself can pick and choose on what he, she wants, really, and needs. So that's a really different request, um, technical-wise. And I, how I look at this is really thinking of the client being really mature. So not that we define stuff, right? OK, looking at um, organizational aspect, what I mean with that, first of all, is looking at the process, which um, brings me to a question that I heard in Marit's talk this morning here. I'm not sure who was here. But there was a question at the end where somebody said, well, how does continuous delivery really fit into the cadence of the process? So because we have here at the end this shipping of an increment, right? Similarly, actually, with something like that. Oh, that's XP. It doesn't look as clean as Scrum, but still. Um, and here we are there. So how does continuous delivery fit there if we have that cadence? And I went back to, like, in both cases, looking at these pieces only. Looked, for example, again in the Scrum Guide and the White Book from Kent Beck. And None of them is saying that you are only allowed to deliver at the end of an iteration or sprint. It doesn't say so. It only says, like, for example, Scrum says in the review retrospective, you are looking at what you have been able to complete during the sprint, but it doesn't say, well, you, you can only ship it at that point. You, be, you are absolutely welcome to ship it whenever it's done. So the process is definitely not in the way. So sometimes we think so, but it's not. Now, um, something else about the organizational aspect is that we um, look at continuous delivery in terms of making delivery more efficient. 
And um, this is actually out of one of the books which I also, oh, yeah, the, yeah, you see it here, which I also recommend, so Practical Guide to Continuous Delivery by Eberhard Wolf. So he looks at, well, what's happening after the commit? And if you see the peaks to the top, it means like some work gets done. If the peak goes downwards, then it is uh, meaning that we have to wait. And um, so it's waiting time, nothing happens there. And, and so you see, well, probably this team can still do some stuff better by maybe not losing five days before they go into acceptance testing. Maybe they can also speed up acceptance testing, so all of that. So they, they can still do better in really um, delivering continuously. However, actually, the real problem that I'm seeing nowadays is not that part. It's actually more here. So looking at the holistic view, because most of the time we are losing way before committing. So this example is there's maybe a, a request coming in because we have a new regulatory, regulatory uh, uh, requirement or the customer wants something and then we approve maybe, well, the, the request is submitted and then we approve it at some time, like four weeks later in this case, then two, one and a half weeks later, we look at, oh, what is actually effective, what kinds of stories are in that, and so on. Then we might have a customer sign off, and only then it gets into a backlog, really. And so we are far away from that commit part we had seen earlier. So, and here we lose already almost three months, or I think it's about three months. So really having the holistic view is what would help us way better to to really get more efficient here. So what this requires is actually what I call seamless collaboration. Seamless collaboration across different roles, hierarchies, teams, departments, all of that, because otherwise we will never have the real benefit from continuous delivery. Now looking at the last aspect, right, the market aspect. So um, there is one, one problem that I think we often overlook, which is deployment isn't the same as release. And the terminology that I'm using here is the one that Goiko Achi came up with. Um, let me tell you, so what's meant with that, deployment means that technically we put the code into production. Release means it's a marketing event. It's something where we surprise our customers. And it can be at the same time, but it doesn't have to. And as this example from that basketball match, well, sometimes the customer doesn't want to be surprised. Maybe not in that way, at least, right? And um, just if you have, might not have seen it with this terminology, there are also other terminologies floating around. I know that I have used for many, many years always internal release versus external release. Or then there it's called a technical versus a marketing release. That's Eric Ries' terms. So there, there are like different terms for that. But the important thing is to really be clear and differentiate which is which. And if you, um, yeah. Right, so this is one aspect of, of the market aspect, market perspective. There's another thing, and going back to Tesla. So now that the clients kind of figured out that there is this over the air update coming up, Tesla fell, fell into another trap, which is also something you can fall into, which is how to deal or manage expectations. So I think it was even the same year as that other incident I was talking about. So in that year, Tesla came up with a new Model S. In that new Model S, they had this unit for autonomous driving, but at the time it didn't do much. So it did like lane control or distance control, of course, cruise control. And Tesla said like, okay, but we promise you if you buy that car, you will get over-the-air updates and probably there will be a time where that unit really allows you to autonomously drive. Now, everyone else who had like the model before then was really angry because they said, well, we want that as well. We have bought a Tesla Model S and we want that too, right? And we know that you can do that. And they even started a petition 
And so they had some people signing up for it, but actually it were not enough, probably it's because it's still a too small community here. And Tesla then said, well, the thing is, because it also needs a hardware unit, and that's why we can't do it. However, my main point is, with continuous delivery, you also kind of create expectations you have to um, deal with and manage. Another thing is, now you deliver the stuff, you also need to ensure you understand how people are using the system you are building. So I think what we really need is to monitor and test in a different way which features are actually used. And maybe we features had been used and over time they are not used anymore and therefore the system should also adjust to it and we shouldn't be still maintaining it and carrying that waste with us. So we need to learn from the deployment as well. So that's another different aspect from the market point. And um, yeah, so actually it is more about outcome versus output. So continuous delivery shouldn't be so much about, well, just shipping stuff. It should be ensuring that what we are shipping makes a difference for the customer. So it has had an impact in the customer's role. Now the question is, how do you decide on delivery? So what should be really shipped? And the one question is, is it usable? And that's more the aspect probably we talk most about. So is the quality good enough and so that we can ensure everything so we can ship it? But also, is it feasible really? Because maybe you want to package it with something else together in order to really make a difference. And lastly, is it valuable, which is more as something that can be answered by marketing or sales, so that now this way we make a difference in our client's world. And um, I think, well, I'm, I'm impressed by myself. How cool is that? Because I manage really the time, so I'm wrapping up. Um, so tools and technologies is still a thing, however, I really believe we need to look at it at CD from a different angle in order to really benefit from it. And I want to close with the quote of a friend of mine, Three, that's really his name, Roman Three. Um, unfortunately, he passed away two years ago. And um, I was sitting with him at a, like a, a small gathering and we were having lunch in a room where before us there was a meeting where people, it seemed, spoke about the actual principles. And three always kind of, a, I don't know, he, he liked to outburst something and so. And so he saw that principle which said, working software is the primary measure of progress. He looked at that and then he said, Jutta, I'm not sure. Does this really make sense? Shouldn't it be rather effective customer as the primary measure of progress? I thought this is extremely smart. And I'm not suggesting we change the actual manifesto, but maybe in some way we want to change our understanding about some of the things and to really, um, yeah, benefit from that. So with that, thank you very much. And it's really on time. <laughs> Thank you. And actually, my two latest books, that's the retrospective one and the company-wide agility one, they are still at the bookstore if you want to check them out. So, thanks. Yeah. Yes, I do. So, this one, yeah. Is there time for questions, for one question? Yeah. Oh, how cool is that? Yes. Any questions? So, there's a huge question. One more? Yes. Talking about the cultural differences. The last one, this one, okay. Yeah. Uh, the cultural differences when you talk about, are we talking about cultural differences of the customers who are receptive to the continuous delivery uh, or cultural differences that, uh, like for example, uh, the GM uh, used by uh, uh, different countries of different <laughs> nature and ah. then you start losing yes. trust yeah. Because trust is more important than the yeah. look and feel of the vehicle. So yeah. different my things come to my mind yeah. when you say culture. So the question is, what do I really mean with cultural differences? Actually, I don't, in this way, here in this context, I don't think of like 
different cultures in terms of nations, countries also. That's not the thing, but more like the way we develop software, we do it with the specific projects of a development culture, and this needs to be changed in order to really benefit from CD. Yeah, thank you for this question. Okay, thank you. <laughs>